So it was about a year ago that we recorded our first video together about the COVID-19 pandemic. We've learned a lot since then. A lot has changed since then. And I wonder if you could give us an update on where COVID-19 is at right now in our county and um, just kind of how things are looking currently with the hospital situation and the infection rate and all that. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Nice to be with you again. So um, we have a number of things that are happening right now in the, in the COVID world that are, that are worth thinking through. Uh, the first is we're coming off the, uh, the bad uh, surge that we had in December and January here in St. Louis. Um, we've gone down to numbers that are about where we were in uh, September and October before the huge surge hit uh, later in the fall, but we've not really dropped below that. Uh, it's important that there's a variant that is more contagious than the virus that was circulating last year. And that variant with how easy it is to catch from other people is causing a slow increase in cases here through the month of March and into the early part of April. So that variant is called B1.1.7 and originally uh, um, identified in, in Britain, but now spread throughout the US um, and it's, uh, it's, it's quite contagious. Important to remember with this extra contagious virus is it was 1% of all cases in the United States in February. It now is the single dominant strain in the entire country. Mm -hmm. So it has quickly supplanted uh, other strains of the virus, including the Wuhan strain that was circulating last year. Um, along with the variants that came out of both California and New York in the United States. So it's really very contagious. And so uh, we're, uh, extra precautions are needed to keep this from um, spreading. Now, the good news is that the vaccines that are out do cover this variant and are effective against it. So if we can get enough people vaccinated uh, soon enough, then we can start fighting off this more contagious version of the disease and hopefully fight coronavirus back such that uh, we can go back to some normal living uh, once enough people are vaccinated. What kind of precautions are we talking about here? Masks and social distancing, are those still effective? Are, are they things that people should do to protect against this? And is there anything else people should do? Sure. Not everybody is going to want to get a vaccine uh, or be able to get the vaccine in some cases. So in those circumstances, absolutely masks work and social distancing works. In particular, though, um, as we gather in group settings like church, uh, having a mask on the entire time that you're in the building, having a mask on while doing any kind of a uh, singing or, or other kinds of, uh, of talking is essential to try to, uh, to keep the spread of the virus down. Um, we've learned that we don't necessarily need to all have N95 uh, aggressive masks on that are difficult to breathe in, but a simple surgical mask or a multi-layer cloth mask is sufficient to, um, um, to cut the risks down. Now, if you can get your hands on a surgical mask, and they sell them in boxes of 50 at a time, uh, and they're fairly inexpensive, um, those are a better choice than just uh, a homemade type of mask. But, uh, but masks do work, and it's important that we, we use them in these settings. Special caution should be uh, observed when uh, in a group setting in a closed airspace inside with multiple people. So for instance, restaurants uh, are a classic uh, now that's a real challenge for us because everybody takes their mask off while they eat in the restaurant. And if you're there for one to two hours, you've essentially breathed in the air that everyone else in that restaurant has, has breathed in that time. And so we see a lot of spread occurring through group settings like that, where everybody feels uh, comfortable taking their masks off. So if you can stay masked uh, when you're in group settings, that, uh, that helps a ton. And masks are helpful primarily because they catch the respiratory droplets coming out of your mouth and nose, not because they're going to so much protect you from other people. Is that is that right? It's a little of both. Um, so certainly in terms of keeping whatever your germs are in, uh, masks are very good ab about that. In particular, the surgical masks that are out there, uh, uh, the fabric that they're made from is very absorbent. And so they, they catch res most respiratory droplets anyway and can, and can uh, trap the virus inside the mask. Um, but even coming from the outside, as, as other respiratory droplets are out in the, uh, in the air that you're breathing in, it's nice to have a filter on the way in to screen some of those out. So, uh, yeah, if, uh, the combination of, of everybody wearing a mask uh, who needs to um, uh, really does help a lot in terms of, of uh, keeping, keeping infection rates down. And as far as social distancing goes, the CDC recently upgraded their guidelines to three feet four children in schools, I think. Does that apply to anyone else? Should adults still be staying about six feet apart in public? Yeah, adults need to stay six feet apart. So that the three foot rule was specifically for schools, uh, was specifically for schools that have access to um, uh, certain airflows, uh, open windows, 
um, the, uh, the air filters that a lot of schools have placed in each classroom. And uh, based on studies actually showing that uh, the disease burden amongst uh, school-aged children is mild and that the severity of illness is also very mild. And so um, uh, school kids can safely do this, but for the rest of us uh, in the adult world, uh, six feet is still the, still the rule. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned singing with masks on earlier, and we recently started uh, doing a lot more singing together in church. I, I remember um, not quite a year ago, there were some studies about singing and, and how much they could spread viral droplets. And it was something like 30 times more than talking that they would just spew uh, viral droplets into the air. And so we cut back on the singing. Um, but we're, we're doing more of that these days, but we're just making sure we have our masks on. Is it safe to sing with masks on or reasonably safe? Based on the data that we have now, if everybody in the church auditorium is, uh, is wearing a mask while, uh, while singing, then we should be reasonably safe in, in doing so. Again, the masks are not, are not perfect, but they, uh, they do catch the grand majority of viral particles and respiratory droplets that any of us uh, emit. So as long as people are wearing a good quality mask, we should be okay. The one kind of mask we should avoid is any kind of mask made out of nylon or um, a performance fabric like you might have with a, a, a stretchy Lycra shirt uh, that you might wear at a sporting event or something like that. Those, uh, those fibers that are nylon and, and don't have any absorbency uh, to them at all actually really don't retard the respiratory molecules and they pass right through that mask. So um, that's the only kind of mask we would be concerned about having. But if you've got an absorbent mask on, then you should be in good shape. So cotton is the way to go. Cotton or, or, or uh, cotton-like fabrics that, uh, that are made with uh, the surgical masks and the kind of masks that, uh, that eventually N95s and KN95s are made out of, yes. Okay. What about the future here? What does this look like with COVID-19 and the pandemic and now this new variant that's surged in, in prominence here? Um, what can we expect moving forward? What's it, what's it going to take for this to go away in the future? Yeah, it's going to take a lot of people getting vaccinated. Um, so right now, the, again, the, the variant that's circulating is more contagious than what we had last year. So unless we can get a whole host of people vaccinated, we know just from how all of us have behaved over the last year that uh, we're going to end up with another surge here in late spring unless, unless enough vaccine can, can penetrate the population and stop the virus from spreading. So the encouragement right now is for everybody who is medically appropriate to do so, and, and most all of us are, with just some exceptions, um, should get a, a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine in the United States. And um, it's a, it's a two-shot protocol, but you get 80% of the benefit actually from the first shot alone. So even if you just get in one shot, uh, you should be protected in the short term fairly quickly. So um, if we can just get enough people vaccinated up in the 85% range or so, then, uh, then we should be in good shape. Right now in St. Louis, about a third of the population has received uh, two shots or the equivalent uh, for folks that got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is only a one-shot protocol. Um, and so we'd love to get that up around 60, 70, 80 uh, percent in order to provide you know, the kinds of herd immunity that we talk about where um, uh, the virus will effectively stop circulating in the, in the uh, community because so many people have immunity to it. So, um, so really, it's a vaccine campaign right now. And these vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, are they relatively safe? Are they effective? Do they keep you from getting coronavirus or do they just keep you from the worst versions of it? Yeah, there's a lot going on with vaccines right now. So I'll walk through the, the four kinds of vaccines people are probably hearing in the news. So both Pfizer and Moderna uh, are made with this mRNA uh, type platform. Um, they really are the most advanced vaccines we've ever created and uh, so far are very, very effective in the field. About 95 or so percent of the time, people who've had a, um, uh, a vaccine and uh, become exposed to uh, significant amounts of coronavirus will not get infected at all. Um, and so it's only a one in 20 chance of having any type of infection uh, despite your exposures. Uh, of those people who do get an infection, no one in the trials and actually in, in practice now we see that, that virtually no one um, ever gets uh, severely ill, uh, needs hospitalization, intensive care unit, and nobody to date has died um, uh, from coronavirus after receiving these uh, two vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. So, um, so these vaccines are incredibly effective, um, both at keeping you from getting sick and also um, uh, uh, from severe illness and death. Most of us don't uh, change our lives uh, over the 
risk of getting a cold. Uh, we risk our lives or change our lives over the risk of, of you know, getting severely ill and dying. So, so both of these vaccines uh, clear the way nicely for, uh, for that to happen so that uh, normal life can resume. There is a recent uh, story in the news about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, the J&J vaccine has been proven to be just as effective as the other two uh, in preventing severe illness and death. It's, it's a slightly less effective um, than, uh, than the other two at uh, just keeping you uh, from getting sick at all uh, in a, with a mild infection. Um, but that, that effectiveness rate, even at its, its current um, level, is honestly a little bit better than the annual flu shot that people get on an every year basis. So it's still a very good vaccine. There has been an issue where six people have been reported to get blood clots after receiving the vaccine. That's out of about 7 million uh, or so total vaccines given. And so it's not clear that um, the shot is causing uh, these blood clots because it's a, you know, obviously incredibly low percentage of people that, uh, that have gotten the shot. Um, so it's being investigated, uh, which means essentially our safety system is working. So when you, when you have a new vaccine like this, there's a safety monitoring system that the, the U.S. government and others will, um, uh, will engage in to ensure that, you know, as we see problems, that those are identified and investigated. So that investigation is going on. We might see the Johnson & Johnson vaccine stopped in the U.S. based on that investigation, or they may, they may uh, 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 come to the findings that uh, the vaccine really is not inducing these blood clots. It's simply a, a, a random occurrence of people who had a high risk of blood clots from, for some other reason. And uh, we might see the return of that vaccine to the U.S. The vaccine that I think you will not see in the U.S. at any time soon is the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, there's also been blood clots uh, associated with, with that vaccine, but at a much, much higher rate than with the J&J &J vaccine. And so both Europe and Africa have made dramatic changes uh, in their use of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And the U.S. Uh, uh, FDA has not approved for that vaccine to be used in the United States. And I don't think at this point it will be. So, um, so that, those are the four shots that are in the news right now that people will be seeing. But if you can get the Pfizer or Moderna shot, uh, I got the Pfizer shot personally, and, um, they, and they are very safe and uh, very, very effective. And so I think that's really the way to go right now. And the Pfizer and Moderna shots are the ones based on the mRNA technology that's really, really fascinating. A very different kind of vaccine than what we've typically gotten in the past, right? It is. It's quite different. Um, and it was able to be developed very, very quickly once we had the genetic sequence of the virus. And uh, interestingly, um, uh, other vaccines will likely be based on this platform. I think you'll over the next five to 10 years, you'll see other attempts at uh, 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 vaccine improvement will use this same technology. So this isn't the last of the mRNA vaccines that I think we'll see. And this vaccine technology was already in development for a long time before COVID-19 came along, right? Wasn't it in response to previous coronaviruses maybe or something along those lines? Yeah, I mean, so there, there's been, uh, there've been some scientists that have been championing this as a, uh, as a method for a long time, but it really didn't have uh, an application that, um, that was, was very effective or that was uh, um, kind of an obvious use of this technology. So the technology has been around and, and the companies already had it. So that when uh, when this virus came out and the genetic sequence came out, there's there's two different companies, BioNTech and uh, and Moderna, that that um, recognized right away that this this might be an easy way for them to get to the to the right answer and leverage the technology that they already had to to do this. So yes, this wasn't the first time we've done it. It's just the first time we've had a a vaccine of this kind of scale and magnitude uh, with this platform. And so it's uh, it's been it's you know the results have been better than anybody expected. So I think I think we'll see more of it. That's incredible. Last question. When do you think we can take the masks off? Ooh, uh, yeah, it's a good question. So a lot of that will depend on whether or not we can fight off this little mini surge that's going on right now in St. Louis. Um, and if we can, and enough people get vaccinated uh, over the next uh, two months, then over the summer, I would imagine the masks uh, might come off. Um, if, uh, if we don't do that, if we end up with, you know, 30, 40 percent of the of the society that do, doesn't want to get a vaccine, then I think we'll see circulating levels long enough that uh, we will still have to wear masks into the fall and maybe into 2022. Uh, it's really a matter of, of um, uh, prevention and how much we can we can shut down the 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 contagiousness of this virus and passing person to person. Again, vaccines, the best way to do that. But your masks and your distancing work well, too. Um, so uh, if people uh, don't want to get a vaccine or can't get a vaccine, then that's uh, that's the right way to go. Um, 
the uh, the challenge will be if folks uh, continue to go to restaurants, to Six Flags, to concerts, to other things which which are group settings, and take their mask off, then I think we'll see uh, I think we'll see a lot more spread here, and we'll continue to have to live this way for a while yet. I know I said that was my last question, but I actually have one more. Is there a risk that if we don't have enough vaccinations and we don't get to that herd immunity number? or we aren't as careful with the masks and social distancing, that there will be new variants pop up like this British variant that, that maybe will cause more havoc or could be more contagious or maybe even more lethal or maybe not be impacted by the vaccine. That, that is the worry. So the worry amongst folks that um, are tracking this and trying to uh, uh, encourage the public to act in unity as much as they can are very worried that if we allow the virus to continue to circulate through large groups of people, that eventually you'll have um, other variants that will pop up. It's just inevitable that they will. And if you, we end up with a variant that is both contagious and gets bat by the vaccine, such that all the folks that have already gotten the vaccine now are not protected, then we're essentially back to square one. And you might as well um, uh, turn the clock all the way back into the spring of 2020. We'll have large scale surges. We're all gonna have to cluster at home and uh, businesses will shut down and uh, we'll have to wait for the next vaccine that might deal with whatever that new dominant variant is and then start all over again trying to vaccinate the world against it. And so that's that's really why you're seeing the push and the kind of urgency from um, public health officials because we, we need to get this thing shut down before we have another variant that arises that we get by the vaccine. So while we've got vaccines that will kill this thing off and prevent it, um, we're trying to just vaccinate as many people as fast as we can uh, to see if we can kill this thing off and actually get our lives back. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a race, but I'm I'm hoping it's one that that if people can act really smartly uh, over the next two months, that maybe we got a good shot. Okay, Dr. Doug Pogue, thank you so much for coming on and giving us all this extra information, helping to make heads and tails of some very confusing topics. Thanks, Adam. Great to be with you.